All right, so this is uh, part two of the uh, Born Unix uh, review. I wanted to tie it back to chapter 10. In chapter 10, I make the case that with the rise of Christianity in Rome, you had a conflation of all same-sex sex into one category. Now, the word homosexual only came around in the 1800s, but by the time the Christians took over in the 4th century AD under Theodosius, you had procreative category and non-procreative category. That later, procreative was rounded up to heterosexual because a lot of heterosexual acts can be, um, can be procreative. And all same-sex sex is non-procreative. So that's how it was conflated. Now, I do give examples of different kind of, of same-sex relationships. Obviously, Guerrero focuses on masculine on masculine. But I do say, uh, in one of the chapters, I do mention the Canidos uh, uh, in Greece and the Burdashes in uh, Native or North America among the Native Americans. Uh, both of these types were passive, uh, same-sex uh, attracted men. Uh, the Burdashes were almost sort of transgendered, so to speak. And my point with that was to say, well, you can have masculine on masculine and you can have uh, uh, these, these very feminine men. And these two groups were conflated into one. Uh, the, the point is that there are many, there's many other kinds of same-sex relationships that, that are conflated. And I don't think I gave a good enough, uh, or good enough um, review or, or I didn't really talk about the other kind and other types of relationships in much detail because obviously I just want to focus on, on a masculine on masculine. But what the Born Unix page does is it says, well, here's all the details that says that there were effeminate men who would be probably considered gay today who were looked upon as much different than most men who themselves were basically functionally bisexual. So I just wanted to give a little bit more evidence from a couple other books uh, to, to just uh, to tell you how this conflation um, really confuses a lot of things that don't deserve to be in one category. So, from the book Construction of Homosexuality by David F. Greenberg, uh, there we go, uh, on page 98 of the uh, Emo Guy Huddling in a Corner edition, uh, he, write, or he writes that bands of golly roam the countryside dressed as women, sc scourging themselves, dancing and begging. In the Metamorphoses, also known as the Golden Ass, the author portrays the Gali as passive homosexuals who seek out virile young peasant lads to satisfy their cravings. Lucian paints a similar picture in Lucius or the Ass. Uh, so yet again, we have uh, another short little account of, of effeminate men who have sex with other men who are, of course, thought of as a lot different than the, the regular man in the street who as the evidence in Guerrero itself shows, were thought of as basically bisexuals who were more or less masculine and more or less bisexuals. Uh, now, if you look at the table of contents, uh, what uh, David F. Greenberg, F. Greenberg, yes, he categorizes kinship-structured societies in which you had homosexual relationships, and those are vastly different than, let's say, the effeminate type of homosexual. You have social asceticism in the ancient world. Uh, basically, I think he talks about monks there and how uh, they had sex with uh, the younger initiates there. Feudalism talks about the different kind of relationships there, the different kind of same-sex relationships that happen there. Um, the medicalization of homosexuality, that's in the 19th century where you had the rise of basically the gays. Uh, the first gay guy that I always mention, Carl Heinrich Ulrichs, he was the one who created the gay category and said, oh, it's, it's just a, a very small minority, they're effeminate. And he was the one who forgot about all the different kind of uh, same-sex relationships they had in the past. And uh, he continued the conflict. So basically, uh, Christianity conflated everything into one. If it's same-sex sex, it's evil, it's wrong, it's one category. And then when the gays came around, they said, ah, this is referring to us. But they forgot that it refers to a whole lot of, uh, a whole variety of other things. Uh, and that basically continues today where a lot of gays simply imagine that 2% of the population is gay and everybody else is not. Uh, or nobody else is interested in same-sex sex or they give a thousand and one excuses as to why men having sex with men is not really uh, same-sex uh, or genuine same-sex attractions.
So anyways, this is a good book to read. Another one, uh, I'm not going to read any excerpts from it, but I, I even just love the title. It's uh, Homosexualities by Stephen O. Murray. And, I mean, the very title is, is wonderful because homosexualities implies it's not just a singular concept. And that's really the point of chapter 10 is the reason today, again, just to underscore, because this is very important, the reason we have one homosexuality today, and it's thought of as a small effeminate minority, is because Christians took over, said procreative sex is the only legitimate sex, non-procreative sex became homosexuality, and out of the, all the different varieties of homosexualities, only one, the more or less effeminate gay man, is the only variety that survives to this day. That's the only one that came out as a possibility. All the other ones, the the warrior type of homosexual, uh, again, I, I don't even like to use the word homosexual then, but let's say the Spartans. They lived in, in, in all male spaces. They were as masculine as it gets, uh, maybe a little too masculine with all the killing and whatnot. Uh, but nonetheless, you can't accuse them of being feminine. And yet, that's just, oh, it's situational homosexuality. What nonsense. Uh, so anyways, I just wanted to look at the table of contents in homosexualities because it really, as the title of the book implies, it looks at all the different types of homosexuality. So you have the reproduction of warriors. These are societies in which you basically, basically to become masculine, you have to have sex with another man. Uh, I look at Crete, um, uh, I, I think I talk about Crete in the book where it says that a man, for, for a young man to become a full man, he had to have sex with another man, spend some time in the countryside hunting and having sex. Okay, so it's kind of funny how in some societies, if you did not have sex with another man, you were thought of as effeminate. Because, you know, now of course these societies also had effeminate men who wanted to have sex with other men. So, uh, you know, I guess we could, well, I guess we can't ask them about what, uh, what they thought of that. But the point is, you had masculinizing relationships. In order to be a man, you had to be with a man. You had uh, neither masculinizing nor feminizing relationships. Uh, I write about the Hawaiians in which uh, all the tribal chiefs had uh, basically lieutenants who were somewhat in a pederastic fashion, although the, the lieutenants were kind of older. Uh, they were not in their teens. They were probably, probably a little older. But the point is that it was not a feminizing relationship. Now, I think the people in those relationships were masculine, but it was not masculinizing. It didn't make them masculine. They were already masculine to begin with. They were considered as such. Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, boy tops. Uh, there's a short little chapter on that. Uh, gender stratified organization of homosexuality. Uh, so here's uh, chapter six. Male receptacles for phallic discharges. Uh, this has got to be the... Uh, uh, funniest uh, chapter. So basically, it's just bottoms um, who want to be fucked by other men. Uh, sacralized, uh, sacralized male homosexual roles, so temple prostitutes. Egalitarian homosexualities uh, in pre-modern tribal societies. Modern egalitarian homosexualities, the modern homosexual. Hey, I would actually disagree with him. I, I don't well, I mean, a lot of the modern homosexual relationships are between more or less effeminate males. And I, I guess it's equal in the sense that um, you don't have the kind of uh, ancient model of having a masculine man and a feminine man. Uh, but it still is, is, it's still different from the other egalitarian option, which would be two masculine men or agrero. But nonetheless, uh, let's see if there's any more interesting... Okay, no, there's nothing more interesting. Um, but the point is, again, the take-home message is homosexuality is not one thing. So that's why they're, they're never going to find anything that has the homosexual gene. They might find some gay uh, genes. They might find, um, obviously, if, if, if I'm correct and I say that most men have a bisexual potential, you could find something for that. But you're not going to find anything for a homosexual gene or homosexual hormones even because it's, it's, a, it's a conflated topic that was created by Christianity. You know, it doesn't make any sense to have all of these people into one group. It makes absolutely no sense. And the Born Unix page is a great example of a different kind of homosexuality that would exist beyond, besides Guerrero. Okay.
So it, it gives uh, ample evidence that homosexuality itself is a conflation and should not be thought of as a single topic. So anyways, as usual, if you have questions, uh, email or comments or go to the forum or whatever. So thank you very much.